Hey guys, this is Mr. Swatsky. Uh, today I'm going to be telling you about the events leading up to and the attack on Pearl Harbor on 12-7-41, which of course is known also largely as a day which will live in infamy. And in class, we will be comparing 12-7 with another day of infamy, which is of course 9-11-2001. In class, you already looked a little bit as to why the attack happened, which is always a pretty big question. First thing to focus on is that Japan was expanding throughout the Pacific Asia area, as was Germany in Europe. Um, when Japan did that, you read in the article that they did that rather ruthlessly, as did the Germans, but the Japanese perhaps even more so. You read about what they did in China, and they were doing the same sorts of things in Korea and other countries. The United States decided enough was enough and protested what was happening specifically in parts of China. And so what the United States did was they cut off the flow of oil, steel, and iron to Japan. Well, Japan needed oil, steel, and iron in order to expand, as well as some other raw materials. Um, and so they were angry about it. And they maybe saw no other way but to attack the United States. The second big idea is that Japan kind of thought, saw themselves as the um, parent of all Asia and looked down at other Asian countries. Sorry to my Asian students not from Japan, but they looked at... Korea and China, um, the Philippines as lesser powers and people of lesser uh, intelligence. And they um, went ahead and were aiming to t take over all of Asia. The problem in the Pacific was that, well, the United States kind of stood in their way. There's an expression that this city ain't big enough for the both of us. In this case, it applies to the Pacific Ocean, or as these guys would tell you, um, yeah, I don't know what they would tell you. Anyway, taking a look, one of the things I'll talk about in class is the International Dateline, which is about here. It's kind of like a 50-yard line for the Pacific Ocean. This is the Japanese side in the Japanese end zone. This is the American side in the American end zone. And Japan, not only, by the way, attacked Pearl Harbor on that day, but they attacked a lot of other places as well. Their goal was to wipe out American naval um, forces in one shot. And they came pretty close to doing it, but luckily for us, our aircraft carriers were out at sea that day. The details of the attack, um, one thing you need to know is that they were planned for upwards of six months. In fact, there was a naval college in Japan, and their final paper, or their final project, I guess it was a group project, I don't know if they used Google Docs for it or not, but their final project was to um, create an invasion plan, or sorry, an attack plan for Pearl Harbor. So this was something the Japanese had talked about. It was something that the Americans had a better knowledge of than most historians would admit. In fact, about a decade before, they did a practice attack on Pearl Harbor to see what the response time would be. And it was awful. But they learned nothing from it. They just moved on with it. And when the real thing came, it was just as awful. So the Japanese were attempting to knock out our naval power in one surprise shot. Again, going for all of our ships just sitting there, all of our planes just sitting there and surprising us. And it actually almost works. It works largely. There are two waves in the attack. One comes at 7.53 in the morning and the other just about an hour later. The United States forces were caught completely off guard, although really they probably shouldn't have been. Because there were a number of warnings leading up to it, the United States and Japan were negotiating for peace. And the Japanese were kind of cutting off these negotiations. You saw a film about this in class. There was this 14 or 15 part message that a bunch of um, points that the Japanese demands were and they held off on the last one which was the attack at Pearl Harbor. And even in fact as the Japanese airplanes were attacking us at Pearl Harbor it was 1 o'clock in the afternoon back here in Washington DC area. And uh, while they sent peace ambassadors to go and say that they were still maybe interested in peace while they were even attacking us. But there were some people who kind of had a sense that this might happen, and it's really shocking even today that we weren't better prepared. The most famous of the um, specific direct warnings happened about an hour before the attack at 7.02, as you can see here, where we got a radar pickup that there were a whole bunch of planes coming in heading towards Hawaii or towards Pearl Harbor. And this message was passed along, and they thought, oh, don't worry about it, these are American airplanes which are coming in. And we truly were expecting American airplanes, but as we know, that's not what it turned out to be. But there were warnings and thoughts that Pearl Harbor could, of course, be a target, and as it turned out, it was. Here's the air attack. I want to point out the B-17s, if it really was the B-17s coming in, the American B-17 bombers, they would have come in from this direction. 
and landed this way because that was the path that they would most likely take. The Japanese airplanes were coming in from the northern side, so it really wouldn't have made all that much sense to begin with. When the attack commences, the first wave and the second wave are shown here. One of the main targets is right here, and we'll be focusing on that more specifically in this next slide. This area right here um, is near Honolulu, and Honolulu certainly felt the, the effects of the attack. This is a place called Ford Island, and along Ford Island you have something called Battleship Row. And this is where all of our ships were lined up, and all of these ships were basically defenseless early on a Sunday morning. Also over here, Hickam Field, a bunch of planes were all lined up, sitting ducks, as they say. The ship that becomes the most famous on this day, and we'll see a video clip about this in a moment, is the USS Arizona. The USS Arizona was hit twice. You can see the target marks here. This is the one that causes more damage, and that's the one that we'll see the film clip of. When the USS Arizona was hit, um, there were pictures taken. I believe these are actually Japanese surveillance pictures of the attack. You see a lot of oil, and you see um, a lot of um, damage in this area. The USS Arizona goes down. On the USS Arizona, there were about 1,100 people who died, which is about half of the people who died in the Pearl Harbor attack. The USS Arizona is still at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. They did not raise it. If you go to the memorial, it's directly above it. One of the concerns, actually, environmentally speaking, is that it's starting to break apart a little bit, and they're worried that that might actually damage the memorial above. You also see this oil dripping out. Uh, every day, every hour rather, little droplets of oil are still coming out of this almost 75 years later. And it's causing some environmental damage, but some say that this is interesting because it's really a living memorial. If you go out to Pearl Harbor someday, you'll take one of these ships out to where the memorial is. Make sure you get your tickets in advance because they do sell out. Now you can see this also from Google Earth, so that's what we're going to do next. Okay, let's see if I can get this Google machine here to work and to show us Pearl Harbor. Um, and we're going to zoom in. I'm not sure how this will line up on your screen. Well, that's going to work pretty good. A little bit hard to see, and I'm off just a little bit, so I'm going to drag it over here. This is, again, Ford Island, the place where all the ships were kind of lined up. And this is Battleship Row right next to it. And as we zoom in a little bit, you'll see some ships that are still there. That's the USS Missouri, I believe, which is the ship that is uh, where they signed the surrender at the end of World War II. But just showing you here, again, that ship, the Arizona, is still right there. And it is still, um, like I said, kind of a living memorial. This area, as I zoom out, is right next to Honolulu, which should show up on our screen. Yep, over here. Um, the idea behind the attack was to knock out all the ships. Luckily for us on that day, the United States aircraft carriers were out at sea on maneuvers, and so they were not hit. Had they been hit, along with all those battleships, we would have been in a world of trouble. It was bad enough as it was, but it could have been much worse. As a result of the um, attacks, of course, the United States is going to eventually declare war, actually the very next day. You can see what it says here, Japan wars on U.S. and U.S. Uh, Japan wars on the United States and Britain, making sudden attack on Hawaii. Um, we're going to listen to FDR's speech in class, and we're going to be doing some kind of interactive things with it. Um, but lots of memorials have been made because of these attacks, and lots of interesting images have been made as well. Now I'm going to show you guys two things. Um, one is a list of the people who died at Pearl Harbor. And the other is a video clip from the Hollywood movie Pearl Harbor, which shows the attack on the Arizona. So this is the clip from the movie. I'll let you watch it. And I'll have a couple comments along the way. Not sure if the audio is coming through on this or not, but you can see the attack waves coming in. No defenses at all.
And you can see the torpedo come right up to it. And I think by this point people realized this was real. And the people below might not have known what was going on because they're sleeping. They can't he see it, but they can now feel it. But now everybody's aware of what's going on. And the Japanese knew what they were looking for. This guy was looking for the USS Arizona in particular. Not a drill. And as you'll see, as it breaks through, you can see that it breaks through. And Sorry, I had a technical problem there. But the area where it breaks through is the area where all of the, the armaments, the weapons are. So if a weapon explodes amongst the rest of the weapons, you're going to have a problem, like you'll see here. So what you're going to see here are the names of the people who died in the attack at Pearl Harbor. I thought it might be interesting for you to be able to see the 2,000 names that are on here, um, just to see how many of those add up to. Uh, at first, also, what you're going to see are the names of some civilians who died before it gets into the deaths of military personnel. Uh, you have the military personnel list is much longer, but you do have a lot of civilians that died as well. Let's take a look as it starts to churn through at the names of all these people, just to give you a sense of just how many that is. These are people who died at Pearl Harbor, 2,403, again about half of them on the USS Arizona. And they have similar lists for other battles, but um, this number is also very similar to the amount of people who died on 9-11. This is actually just a little bit less. In class we're going to focus on those numbers of people who died and we'll look at one or two names specifically um, as we try to put a face to this terrible attack that the Japanese did on December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. We'll be doing some explorations in class. Uh, make sure you answer all the questions that were left out for you. Thank you.